Welcome to Aperture. We're in conversation with the people thinking and doing things differently. If you like the podcast, please check out our other content on aperturehub.co. Welcome to Aperture. For this episode, we are at the EPFL and we are discussing technology in society. And for this conversation, we are with Jim Laris, who's the professor and dean of the School of Computer and Communication Sciences at EPFL. We're with Philippe Gonzalez, who is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Lausanne. The two guys uh, teach a course together, which is called global issues and looks at the social implications of technology and then we also have david Gabraith with us who's a partner at anthemis and a regular on the podcast and david's here to make sure i get value from this conversation to ask um some provocative questions so jim philippe maybe we can just start by you just explaining uh, global issues what's the, the course and, and yeah the subject matter that you cover in the course. Sure, uh, happy to do it. Um, Global Issues is a course that we require of all of the first year students at EPFL. Um, it doesn't matter what subject they're, they're gonna uh, take at EPFL. And it's taught in sections of about 100, 120 students with a particular focus to each section. Um, the section that uh, Philippe and I teach is called Communications which we've interpreted to mean anything related to the internet. Um, and that's pretty broad. We can cover a lot of technology that way. But the, the idea behind the course is that the students here are basically gonna spend five years studying science, technology, engineering. And it's gonna be a very technical, very focused education. They're gonna come out with a lot of skills. But they may not sort of realize that what they're building or what they're discovering is going to be used in a larger context. And uh, people are going to take their inventions, going to take their discoveries and use it for whatever purposes they want. And so sometimes these um, uses of technology have larger implications. Um, you know, obviously something like the Internet yeah. has had tremendous impact on society in ways in which were impossible to predict 10 years ago, 20 years ago when it really took off. And um, the idea of this course is to get the students to actually think about this during their education, instead of finding this out when they get out into the real world and start realizing that, oh, what I've learned, what I'm doing, actually has implications for the broader society. Instead, we want the students to sort of be aware of this and start thinking about it as you know, principled, ethical uh, people that uh, you know, they need to think through uh, some of what they do, sometimes they actually need to be advocates for a particular position. They need to take a stand as to how their technology is going to be used because they're going to be the ones developing it. You know, particularly our school with computer scientists, a lot of the information technology is going to be developed by students who have backgrounds similar to ours who will be working in companies. And so we want the students to be, appreciate that there's a larger world out there, there are policies, there are social issues, there are legal issues, there are sort of uh, unintended consequences from technology uh, that is fairly common. It's nothing to sort of be surprised about, but it's something that a lot of students are just unaware of. And how did you decide, or when did you decide to introduce this course? Was it in response to some of the scandals we've seen around Facebook and others, or was it, or was it just something you thought was missing from the curriculum? I didn't actually introduce it. It's been here for longer than I've been here, so it's longer right. than six years. Uh, I think EPFL um, decided on it probably about a decade ago, not in response to anything in particular. I mean, you know, a lot of the sections of the course have nothing to do with the internet, nothing to do with the recent scandals. So, you know, there are sections related to health related issues, there are sections related to climate change, sort of larger societal issues as well as information technology. So in a way, EPFL is quite early with this then because yes. you don't see many of these courses and yet a lot of people are, are, are talking more and more about the importance of grounding tech work in 
philosophy and and you know discussing it, the broader implications uh yeah i think that's true epfl was pretty advanced in it yeah it started uh more than a de- decade ago with uh, what we call the the college des humanités the humanities college which was the idea that um uh, engineers here at the epfl uh, would be um i mean would really benefit from being exposed to social sciences history and and it was a way of having this um collaboration between the unil the university of lausanne and the epfl yep. so we've been having um social scientists historians uh, people in liter- literature giving classes here uh but the next level was teaching together and i think that's that's the the, the strength of this global issue uh, curriculum because we are uh, every week uh, we are uh, teaching together two hours and one hour they listen about technology uh, about uh, the specifics of um, the internet or cryptography and then they get to listen for an hour um, uh, about sociology and history and i try to show them that some some things in anthropology for example uh, the invention of uh, writing uh, has a major impact on the way we conceive a uh, internet would you say it's so i guess in in general you would you would argue that it's important for any student to to consider the broader implications of of what they're working on but i guess would you would you consider even more important when people are working with technologies that can have you know almost by definition such a massive impact and, do, and and maybe i can express it more provocatively do you think that that facebook the facebook scandal might not have happened if philosophy had been taught more broadly <laughs> it depends of who they were taught to <laughs> yeah i think that first of all what we try to to tell the students is that some of the things we think are new in technology um are not that new really and some of them have been around for hundreds or thousands of of years and they already had implications on the way society was made thought enforced so one of the first things i i tell the students is for example that when writing was invented it was about uh kingdoms and ruling kingdoms and ruling the economy and writing was not something for the people it was for the elite and so it was a very vertical uh, society and that goes back to the uh, neolithic to to the invention of agriculture uh, well writing has been around uh, for 6000 years but it it was to enforce all those old societies like the pharaohs in egypt or uh, uh babylon for example so i'm telling them see in, in in the internet you have that old technology that's that's there and at the same time we have things that come up uh, that come from the the french and the american revolution because we have this idea of the free press yeah so we have to deal with the internet it's a complex tool and we have it, it inherits previous technologies like the the printing press and like the invention of writing and um the invention of writing was to control society the invention of, of printing and, and and the revolution was to think of a more um democratic free uh, society and we have the two things combined in the internet and now we have to be aware uh of which side we're pushing when so it's like that I was going to ask one thing so the invention of the printing press certainly had a role in the reformation and it literally rewired society and it, and and we can prove this by looking at let's say the distance from Mainz fro to cities like Hamburg um or Seville or uh, places that literally invented not just new um it, invented new types of organization so joint stock corporations and the replacement of feudal societies and, and with with what we today think of as corporations happened because of that now we have a something which seems like a similar phase change i we have a, a technology where 
everyone has a channel, everyone has a voice, we've gone beyond the broadcast medium of printing. Is this going to have a similar phase change in terms of the types of corporations, the types of structures that we will see? Absolutely. It, it changes. I mean, in media, you have always to think that a media is a way of organizing uh, a society. It's a way of uh, um, it's a way of producing goods, defining what is a common good, okay, and defining who's in and who's out. So with uh, the internet, um, we have new ways of um, relating one to to the other, of creating collectives, collectivities, nations, and um, this has an impact because it's redefining what is public, what is private, in a way that's never been thought before. Uh, for example, I can have, that's one of the things you say in, in, in class, if, if you're not paying for it, you're probably the product. So um, it's, it's redefining the way, as a consumer, I'm entering the market and I feel like I'm the one buying something, when in fact I'm the one who's being sold. Uh, through the marks, the traces, I'm, less, uh, I'm lighting uh, on my path. And I'm not aware of that. And that's, while well, now regulations, nations are taking a stance. Uh, for example, now if you click on the internet in Europe, so you have to, to be okay with the policy about cookies. But it's, it's, it's a new enforcement because we started to see the consequences of being tracked. So we're starting to be aware of where this new technology is, is pushing our democracies. And we've seen that with the Cambridge Analytica scandal around the, the Trump election. We see that, well, uh, social networks are not only to, to find old, old mates from high school, they're also ways, powerful ways to influence uh, geopolitics and, and so it is the the current debate has focused a lot on on privacy but one person's privacy is another person's secrecy so how much is this um not just an issue about privacy per se but an issue about balance and for example in the reformation we had before society settled down into a new configuration so so, so, so i mean one yeah. of the points we make is that you know none of this is all good or all bad. And we, we actually explain targeted advertising to the students as part of it. And you know, it's frankly, it's amazing to me, but it's a revelation to many of the students that this is even going on. You know, they're very well informed, they're smart, but they have no idea that they're actually a product being sold. You know, they think that, you know, Google gives them a search engine for nothing, Facebook gives them this connection to their friends for nothing, and that, you know, they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They don't realize sort of the flip side of the bargain. And, you know, at that level, you know, a couple years ago, it didn't appear to be too bad. But then, you know, you sort of take this technology, which has been honed by a lot of very smart people and become extremely, extremely good. And you say, what other use is going to be put to? And you say, politics is a very obvious one. And then you start seeing the implications of applying this technology where you really narrow cast your political message to a group that agrees with you and then we lose one of the arguments for free speech which was you know you put your ideas out in public and if people disagree with them if they think they're wrong they argue against you well that doesn't happen anymore on the internet and so you know we try to sort of explain to the students as part of this that it's not a simple process you know the technology is there the technology can be used for many good purposes, you know, ads that you're shown that are relevant to you are certainly more valuable than ads that are shown that are totally wrong for you and both to you and also to the advertiser. But, you know, there, there are things that can happen because of this that are not predictable. I don't think anybody, you know, 10 years ago when Facebook was a much smaller company would have said that, uh, you know, it would have changed the election, made uh, Donald Trump the president of the United States. But clearly it has. Do you think it is Facebook or do you think it's the, the configuration of the network? It's 
There's a, there if is it, a possibility. If it wasn't yeah. Facebook, it would be some other social network. Right. I don't think Facebook, I mean, I think Facebook is particularly effective because of its scale and because it's an, a social network, you know, the value of it goes up with the number of people and it basically has everybody. So its value is, is much higher than other social networks. But if it wasn't Facebook, there would be some other social network. Before it was MySpace, you know, if Facebook hadn't come, there would have been something else. Are, are there any types of social networks that you think are, in their configuration, are more powerful? So the president of the U.S. uses Twitter, for example, not Facebook traditionally. He uses Twitter because Twitter is a perfect medium for him to just broadcast without any filtering, <laughs> but he's not engaged in a discussion. <laughs> in fact, he would like to prevent a discussion in this right. file, you know, is, is fighting in court to be able to throw people off of his Twitter feed, um, which, you know, in the U.S. seems to be sort of blatantly uh, impossible, but he's still arguing that he should be able to do this. Um, so it shows that it's sort of a not, a, not a social network in some sense. It's a super powerful mechanism for doing press releases. Right. Just An anti-social network. An anti-social network. <laughs> yeah. So, as I said, we'll, we'll, um, we'll come back to questions of, of monetizing the internet and the trade-offs of privacy. And we also want to come back to the ethics of data science. But we just want to get you a bit more on this, on this subject of discourse and the quality of discourse, which is, to go back to this, this analogy of the, of the printing press and the Reformation, initially things got worse, but eventually things got better, right? You know, um, the, the demos became better educated and better able to hold society and democracy to account. Do you think, are you, I'm, I guess the question is, are you guys optimistic that, because it, it, as, as, as we've been discussing, you know, that um, in this new world, it's the, the, the discourse has been challenged because everybody has a voice and people with more extreme views have potentially have a, you know, an outsized voice. And so we've lost this sense of balance. But do you think that over time we will establish the checks and balances such that the discourse will improve and this will be a fundamentally good thing for society? Well, you have to hope so. But you know, remember that, <laughs> as you said the last time, there was the Hundred Year War. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So di phrase yeah, differently. Can we get through this without now, a war? But hopefully, yeah. it's not as as deadly as as that time because we have a lot worse uh, arms than they did back then. Um, you know, you have you have to be sort of optimistic that things that you know that, that these transitions are painful, but that you end up at a, at a better place in the end. Um, you know, but this goes back to sort of one of the other points I make is that the, the internet people sort of um, underestimate the radicalness of the change. I mean, yeah. until the internet occurred, to disseminate anything, disseminate information, it had to be physical. You know, if I wanted to sort of share something with you, I had to write it down on a physical piece of paper. And if you wanted it, I somehow had to get you a physical object. You know, there was a cost to it. And, you know, that served as a moderating function. You know, book publishers in general wouldn't go publish sort of complete nonsense because nobody would buy it and they would lose money on it. And, you know, they would lose the money up front to, to produce the copies of it. So there was this moderating influence even though there were plenty of extreme examples. Um, this is gone, right? You know, the cost of disseminating something, for better or worse, and I think of it in many cases, it's definitely for better, um, is essentially zero, right? You know, I can communicate with pretty much anybody anywhere in the world at zero cost. I can send them large amounts of information at zero cost and zero amount of time. We're not used to this, you know, people, you know, even before the internet really took off, back when sort of only academics were using it, we saw this sort of phenomenon where people behave very poorly in these yeah. groups online. Um, you know, the sort of norms, the behavior, which they would, they would do things they would never do in person, never do face to face with another person. They would have no qualms about sort of calling people names, insulting people, attacking their motives when, you know, they would just never do this in the real world. And we saw this and we sort of, it was kind of a strange phenomena, but it was, you know, it was marginal at the time as small groups. Uh, we now see it on a much larger scale and we see it sort of being utilized um, for sort of bad purposes, I think, for a lot of politicians and a lot of political movements. 
And it's, you know, this is going to be a hard thing to get over because it's clearly something in us where anonymity or even just distance from, uh, you know, another real person lets us behave in ways that, you know, as a members of a group, we don't behave in. And it'll be hard to sort of reconcile that with the fact that we now have a network which has global reach, which allows you to do this with anybody anywhere in the world. Uh, so in some sense, the two movements are very much going the wrong direction. And, and do you have a view on the political dimension for this? Because the left and right have very different views, of the, if, if there is such a thing as left or right anymore, I don't know. But they certainly seem to be operating very differently in terms of issues such as diversity, for example, or whether people who really care about minority issues should mm -hmm. have a voice, mm -hmm. um, and whether the majority should dominate the discussion or not. So uh, these things are nuanced. There's no, there's no straight answer, but there's certainly a very, very different views on these things. Do you, do you have any view on this? You know, I'm an American, so my view is sort of shaped by, <laughs> you know, the view in the United States that free speech should be allowed and encouraged up to sort of a, you know, fairly clear but pretty far limits like advocating violence or injury. Um, but, you know, I have to say that, you know, I think a lot of the argument for free speech, a lot of the sort of the old Anglo-Saxon philosophy that led to it was premised on this idea that it would be beneficial in eliminating incorrect or bad ideas because they would be put into the public, into the market. And that is definitely not the way the internet works. You don't see what's going on. You know, you have this amazing ability to find people who will agree with you because of the advertising technology. So I'm a little wary about sort of, you know, taking all these arguments for free speech and just saying, yeah, they should apply to the internet. So the Chomsky idea that you can manufacture consent, there's this idea that maybe you don't even need to conspiratorially do that. Maybe there's a flaw in the way human beings are that we, we self-configure dystopia. <laughs> well, actually, um, that's, that's really interesting. I believe it's, um, it's something inherent to being a human, a human being. The fact that you have to uh, trust someone else to give you some information. Uh, let's say, uh, if I want to know what it was like uh, for my father to be a kid, I have to ask him, and he's telling me a story. So one of the way we, we get knowledge is to listening to someone telling us a story. So that's a default position, but I think it's a serious advantage of uh, our species when it comes to evolution, because then we can share we can uh, trade and we can transmit that knowledge from generation to generation and, and we can spread it across the globe. So that's one of the things. But of course, trust can be twisted. So I think one of the issues with uh, the internet right now, because it started, you know, it started on a paradox. It started with, uh, it, was, it was something uh, military. It was an, a military exper experiment who was taken over um, in a sense by those, uh, you know, libertarians who were advocating for free speech for an, a new continent. So you, you have the two things uh, in there built in the internet. You have something like uh, a kind of centralized control, even if the military, military experiment was about, you know, if, if a bomb is dropped in a place and, and, and I want a signal to go somewhere, I can bypass that place and I can send a signal. But it was this idea of a chain of command. And, and we see that right now, uh, all the fears we have about you know, facial rec recognition and, and the way China is collecting uh, in information about uh, its citizens, uh, that, you know, that fear is a fear that democracy, as we've known it, is, might disappear. Uh, right now, um, Brit uh, the UK is investing a lot of money into uh, into cameras of video surveillance, and and now the issue is to know if, if they they'll what, um, they'll match the cameras with uh, softwares of facial uh, recognition, and that's that's a major issue, because I mean um, 
in a democracy do we have to film and recognize the face of a citizen walking in a in a public sphere in the public sphere or in a public place that's that's a serious question so one of the things is that yes uh, printing the printing press in the reformation brought a new technology and a new society we had war but we also needed strong institutions that showed us how to use that technology. And I'd like to mention two institutions. One is what we call the Encyclopedia. So you have all these guys, Diderot, Voltaire, uh, who were philosophers and who said, okay, we'll have something like the République des Lettres, the Republic of the Academics. And, and we'll try to share knowledge and to invoke reason, and that will be a strong tool against despotism, against absolute monarchy. And, and actually, they won. I mean, the, the, the world we're living in, the society we're living in, in Europe and in America, um, it was made by their ideas. The second big institution is free press. Free press comes, I mean, it started before the, the English Revolution, but it really thrifts under the, the, the French and the American revolutions. And, and, you know, the ideas we have about, about privacy, they come from the French and the American Revolution. So we're still living in that world. But actually, right now, we have a powerful media that is undermining those ideas, and we're still trying to come up with new concepts. So, to understand the links, bet I mean, the, the articulation between publicity and privacy. So, on this is not something I agree with, but re recently uh, in a conversation from someone who'd lived in China for seven years said that we in the West are getting it wrong, that the, the Chinese see the inequality in Hong Kong and they do not want this to spread to the mainland, and that the reason that they're clamping down is because they they want to keep, you know, Xi Jinping wakes up every morning and has one thought on his mind, which is to keep the country together. And the, the only way you can see that that happening is to not let inequality run wild. And in previous periods of technological progress, we know it creates enormous amounts of wealth, but it also, and Piketty has argued this recently, that it creates inequality. It seemed to happen in Rome and it created an enormously long period after the fall of Rome of people being interested in stories rather than technology and reason. Um, but, uh, you know, but you know, yeah. the, the China has vast inequality. They have the second largest number of billionaires after uh, the U.S. And, you know, if you just go away from the coastal cities where the money has been created, you know, the 300, 400 million people that are still left on the farms there are poor. They're not as poor as they used to be, but there's a huge gap between them and the, their children or whoever's, you know, gone to live in the cities, but without the permanent residence of the cities, without the benefits of being permanent residents of the cities. Right. So I think China has an inequity yeah. problem. I think, you know, they, the, a lot of the the control of the internet, and get back to that in a second, is very much related to political, that they want to show the dominance of the Communist Party, and yeah. that a lot of their concern with Hong Kong is that it's a revolt against the authority of the Communist Party. In fairness, there's some evidence that the, the inequality within the big Chinese cities is dropping, whereas Hong Kong's is increasing. Yeah, perhaps. So, but, so, but, you know, the, yeah. the inequality across yeah. China is still fairly yeah. large. Yeah. But, you know, uh, going back to that, you know, I would sort of correct a little bit of what Philip said. And I think that this is one of the interesting parts of the course is that, you know, the Internet, you know, in my view, started off as a sort of a totally decentralized organization. There was very little control. It was, certainly was not top down. Um, and it was by, by design. It was taken over by academics, by libertarians. And, uh, you know, it was actually very badly built because of this, because nobody sort of thought about the issues of, of what would happen if you put all the world's population on it. So, you know, just to give you a very t tangible example is that there's no notion of identity on the internet. So you can't tell who you're communicating with. You know, I could put up an account named Donald Trump and, you know, except for the fact that I would be more reasonable, you couldn't tell me from the President of the United <laughs> States. Um, <laughs> 
Hey, you know, th this is a fundamental flaw that, you know, people that look at it now and say, how could we have gotten it wrong? But at the time, it made a lot of sense to build an internet that was simpler without this sort of strong trust. The cryptography that we needed to do it right didn't exist at the time. So, you know, it would have been a, a very difficult task. And for a long time, people thought, you know, this is actually a strength of the internet, that it, you know, it was decentralized, there was no control, it wasn't top down. And, you know, that, you know, there was a sort of saying in the 90s, you know, uh, the internet sees censorship and routes around it. I think it was John uh, Perry Barlow, uh, Barlow or whatever, uh, uh, came up with this. But, you know, China proved this totally wrong. Uh, basically, that if you had enough money, technological smarts, and people, you can control the internet. And so, you know, China has one of the sort of most interesting internets, but it's a different internet than we have. You know, commercially, they use it for far more things than we do. It's, it's a mobile internet as opposed to uh, you know, our, our sort of more desktop-based internet because they started later. Um, there are a couple of apps there that are sort of much more interesting than the apps that we have on our phone, things like WeChat, which allows you to pay and sort of interact with people in sort of ways that we can't do in the West because we have a sort of more static banking system. Um, so, you know, they had the benefits of a lot of the internet, but they have sort of absolute political control. You cannot use it for sort of expressing political opinions that are counter to the government. You will be found, you will be stopped, regardless of whether you have strict identity or not. So, this is uh, interesting. I mean, if, you know, 20 years ago, people would have said, no, you couldn't have done this with the internet, and China proved them wrong. And it'll be interesting to see in the future which internet wins. We, so we, we want to come back to those questions of okay. the different, sure. <laughs> no, to the, of the different, um, you know, manifestations of the uh, different types of internet, depending, you know, the Chinese internet, the U.S. internet, whether there's even a, a concept of the European internet. But just f just before we get there, because we that we definitely want to delve in on that subject, because there's 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 um there's lots to say. I just want to go back to something that Philippe was talking about. You know, when when he when he talked about the institutions that grew up in response to um to the to uh to to the last significant change in the way we communicate do you think that those that the balances and the institutions we need for the digital world will happen organically will people you know c configure their activities in a way that's different or does it take the intervention of the state because and how would that work because um, we've we've talked a lot on other podcasts about GDPR and whether that's really actually any help at all. So, does does the state need to get involved? And if the state needs to get involved, what might that state intervention look like? <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> you know, I think China has already intervened and sort of decided what 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 the model is going to be in China. I think the U.S. is struggling with it because of the sort of free speech. Um, makes it very difficult. But, uh, for could, the, I, could I ask a different question then? Which is like, the if you if you take a platform like Facebook, yeah, does it have a duty to protect the truth? And can that can that even be done at scale? So, who who's answering that question? I think is yeah. it depends on. It. So the the answer in China is it has a duty to protect the truth as defined by the central party. Period. Yep. In the United States. There is no duty because it is a private institution, and uh, you know private institutions are not covered by the Constitution. There's, you know, a very permissive law which allows them to sort of get away with uh, taking no responsibility for what's posted on Facebook. Um, in Europe, I think it's different. I think you know there is quite a, there is a sort of wider range of opinions about the obligations of companies and sort of the ethical point of view that companies uh, have to take sort of um, responsibility for the consequences of their decisions, their actions, their behavior here. And so there's a lot more freedom to, to negotiate. And we've seen this with, uh, you know, Germany, for instance, forcing them to take down all mentions of Nazis and Nazi uh, positions uh, quite quickly. Um, so I, I suspect that the answer will depend very much on where you are and where you live and what government you're under and you know things like gdpr which have this sort of far-reaching implication or even you know the earlier version of it which was the the sort of right to be forgotten 
that you could sort of remove information from the Google search index. Uh, in, but but in the, the interesting thing, I guess, about the GDPR approach is it's trying to give us as individuals more power over our own privacy and our own data. But you yourself said that you've got students and, you know, it's but these students that come to PFL are this, uh, the top 1% of students, right, in terms of academic ability. And if they're not even aware of some of these but, trade-offs... But, but, but it's, even, it's even worse than that. You, yeah. know, you sort of look at uh, experience with uh, privacy uh, or security, where you get this pop-up on the screen that says, you know, this is not a good idea for the following reason. Do you want to do this? There's a huge amount of research which says that 99 out of 100 people are just going to click yes i want to do this because you're in the middle of doing something yeah, of course. and this is getting in the way and you just want to get it out of the way you're not really sort of thinking about the fact that it may sort of open up your machine to all sorts of uh, problems or attacks or something like this and the same thing with gdpr i would predict that probably same thing 99 percent of people see this pop-up that's obstructing the view of their screen they just click yes without sort of seeing it but I suppose the counter is if, it's, if the answer to this isn't to empower the individual to take more responsibility, then the answer has to be to, for a larger body, e.g. the state, to intervene in some way, no? Or well, actually, what, we, what you're saying is, is really interesting because it's, we're, we're coming back to something called the tragedy of the commons. And yep. it, it is this idea that came up in the, in the, in the 60s that if you have you know, some land and you have sheep, you know, uh, feeding on the land. And, and I, I've got my flock, you've got your flock, and, and we don't coordinate, you know. By the end of the week, there is no more grass, and by the end of the month, I mean, we, we just kill the land. Okay, so the idea is, um, what can we do? So two solutions have been offered. One is privatization. I buy the land, I put a fence around it, and that's it, and I'll, I'll make sure... I, I take care of the land. Or option number two is the state buys the land, puts a fence o o around it, and, and takes care of, the, of the, the land. The thing is, one of the problems with, one of the problems with uh, individual action is that usually we don't pay much attention to consequences. But then came up a uh, very interesting economist, and she got a Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize for it, and, and her name is Eleanor uh, Ostrom. And she said, well, actually, we can think about collective action, the commons, the way we share a common. And I think that's, that's one of the most inter interesting ways of uh, thinking about building new institutions for the web. It's neither the individual, because if it's only about my personal responsibility, I'm, I'm not aware or, or I'm not capable of, of I mean, uh, having the, the, the craft or having the knowledge, the tools. But if I share um, a common purpose and, and I enter into a collective and we start thinking together like in, in Wikipedia and, and everything that has to do with the wiki philosophy, then it's not only the individual, it's not the state, it's something in between. And we can, it's more plastic, it's, it's less legalized, but we can arrive at some very interesting solutions. So now I have an example. I mean, it's not only about the, 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 the wikis, it's also about the issue of law, because it's not we're talking about a technology that has an impact on, on your life. And for example, if you get your um, credit card number stolen, okay, what can, we, what, what can you do? Of course, you can go to the police and file a complaint. Okay. And then where can you voice your problem? Uh, you can voice it on the forum of your bank, you know, on their website. But it remains an individual complaint. But if you start to merge with other people whose card has been stolen and you build a collective and then you, you start lobbying at the state to change the law, you don't have, you know, the state meddling into the technology because it wants to overpower the technology. You have citizens concerned by the consequences of a certain technology asking to change the law to fit actual 
uh, situations. So I would think that that's the best way to build new institutions around that technology. That means that we're not building it from scratch, uh, from a, an ideal, ideal, I'm sorry. From uh, we're not building this technology from uh, uh, a perspective that is ideological. We're building this new technology through practical situations, and and through the consequences of those situations. In, well, I mean, these these kind of packs between the mass and and the people who are rich, basically. So so. Yeah. That in the industrial era, you had collective bargaining through unions and things like this. Yeah. What what happened? That was when one bunch of people, instead of working in farms, were now operating the machinery. But you needed people to operate the machinery. What happens when you have robots and and basically the people who own, have the capital also own the machines who operate themselves? So, it, so before we go to that, which I think is a great. Right. Topic. Let me just add one thing to this thing. So that another way to look at GDPR is that it didn't go far enough. That you know, it basically just said we're going to give you con informed disclosure and consent, so you can say yes or no. But really, what was missing was the fact that you're giving something to this c company that you're interacting with, and they're turning around and monetizing it, and they're not really sort of paying you anything for it except by providing a service which may not reflect its value. Um, so, you know, one thing that has been explored and I think is actually a very interesting idea is this notion of sort of selling your information to companies and sort of it becomes a, a, an actual transaction where you say, yeah, you can track me, you can sort of use it to target advertising, you can use it to sort of sell information to your advisors but you know you have to pay me you know whatever the unit is per uh, your interaction and then you know that obviously would be a contract it would have to be enforced by you know a government because otherwise you know it's it's not likely to happen but there you know the the interaction becomes a lot richer you can make the straight off you know do I really need the money or do I want my privacy because right now the trade-off is do I want uh, to use this website or do I want my privacy? And you know, you're, you're, you're given a sort of much worse choice than almost everybody will say, I'm in the process of using this website, I want to use this website. Do you Should, think that needs to be, the amount of money for an individual might be quite small. Do you think that needs to be a, a data union, like a, a, like a collective? Well, there, there is that yeah. view that you could sort of have larger aggregates of, of people that would make it much more significant. Um, you know, I don't know if the, the amount of money is that small. Facebook, you know, in the United States makes between two and three hundred dollars per person uh, for the advertising. I mean, that's by far and away the largest in the world. You know, many countries it makes almost nothing, but they're, you know, uh, countries where there's less uh, developed advertising industry. But, you know, is it going to make you rich? I don't think so, because it only wins in the aggregate, so for any individual that's not going to make a huge amount of money for them. But it would sort of shift the balance quite a bit, and you would be able to make a much more intelligent trade-off. Is it really worth, you know, disclosing this information for, you know, a penny? Probably not. You, you, you might ask whether that trade-off should be necessary in the first place anyway, though, right? Because so what you're saying is that at the moment we give our data um, in exchange for a service, and what you're saying is we should give, we, sh we should be paid in exchange for giving our data. Look at the verb you use: you give, <laughs> like it was a gift of our data. It, and yeah. then what, I, what I'm saying is, no, it's a commercial transaction. They, 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 the, the company on the other side turns around, takes this gift, and sells it to someone else for a lot of money. But the so what, what I was getting at was like, so we wanted to come back to this idea of the Chinese internet because. The, there are many issues which I think we've already touched on with the Chinese model, but, but one of the positives is that because it's built on a mobile internet and a, and a much better payments infrastructure, people pay for the services that they, uh, that they subscribe to, right? Rather than, rather than having through some, you know, through some uh, opaque uh, transaction actually give their data away. Because well, they're but, they, but they give their data away. There's a vast amount of information collection, much more than we would tolerate in the West. Yeah. The, almost the default is this, this, the yes. data is exposed, but there's no 
But certainly if you look at the podcast market in China, for example, it's 10 times the size of the US one, and is it's it? all people paying for content, uh, yeah. whereas in the US it's all well, advertising. There is a micropayment system, so you can yeah. pay yeah. for sort of small quantities of things without getting a credit card fee. Exactly. Yeah. And all but, but don't you think that's sort of inherently the problem with the US internet, which is because there's no concept of micropayments, what the next best model was um, and is probably for the foreseeable future, advertising, which has two issues, right? One is you sort of, you know, you dupe in a way the consumer into giving you their content. And secondly, it creates a fundamental conflict of interest, right? Because are you ever acting in the interest of the consumer? Or are you always acting in the interest of the advertisers who pay you? So I, you know, I don't think it's a, not, I don't think it's a trade-off. I mean, I think, you know, advertising was going to happen on the internet, regardless of whether we had micropayments. It was way too attractive a vehicle, and there were too many smart people who saw the connection between, um, you know, what you were doing and being able to sell an ad that was related to that, to sort of have that not happen, even if there was a micropayment system. At the same time, I think a micropayment system would enable a lot of really interesting things to happen on the internet because people could get paid for it without yeah. doing advertising. But I think you'd see a much, much larger monetization of the internet with micropayments because, you know, advertising's what two percent of GDP? Therefore, you know, can ha that surely put some sort of constraints on the size of? I mean, the certainly, so WeChat have reduced the number of ads because they can because there's much more micropayment purchasing of content. So yeah. it, there is some evidence it does seem to change the model as to whether people pay for stuff or yeah. whether it's advertising. Pay. And one of the things we try to say as well is that um, advertisement on the internet has an impact as well on the other media starting with the press Correct, and, yep. and one of the problems we have with democracy is that the the standards the standards of, of the press are are getting low and low and low because they can't afford right now to have um, inv investigative journalists because it's it's very expensive and it used to be funded by the the money coming from the advertisement for the newspapers and now all that money is migrating to the to the web and uh, so we see all those huge uh, I mean, newspapers uh, really being being pushed to um, rethink the way they, they do journalism uh, to the point that they can't afford except for the New York Times or the Washington Post or Le Monde they, they can't afford to have in, uh, very good journalism done in the field, long-term jour journalism. So that's a real problem for democracy. But even those publications like the New York Times that still have the money to do investigative journalism, you know, they're still doing things like changing the headlines of their articles several times during the day to see what gets more clicks. Of so course. everybody's, you know, of everybody's um, drawn towards sensationalism because sensationalism gets eyeballs and eyeballs get advertising dollars. Yeah, but, you know, I read the New York Times regularly, and I would say that their investigative journalism has gotten better. You know, they, they went into a trough where they were really worried about surviving, and now the Internet seems to be their friend, and they have some very interesting uh, series now, quite a, uh, with a lot of resources and, all, and actually it applied in new ways. You know, they were able to sort of take very large amounts of data and then present the information visually in ways that you could just never have done on paper. So, so do, you, do you almost see the New York Times then as, as, a, as a reason for optimism that these, these sort of industrial age um, institutions can adapt themselves? Let, let me sort of turn the table and basically say, you know, the fact that you can do a podcast with the sort of you know, wires and technology in our office and you, got, you can make a business out of it. Uh, you couldn't have done this without the Internet. And you know, this is another form of journalism. This is another way of disseminating information. It's not about sort of current news, but it's about the bigger issues behind the current news investigative journalism. You know, I think that that's fantastic. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to sort of put a lot more information out there in front of it. And it goes back to the fact that there's no cost to do that. So yeah, it's, it has really hurt the, the newspapers. You know, they had basically a, a monopoly on a certain type of advertising for a long time. And, you know, the TV came along and sort of hurt them, but they sort of responded. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it's painful, the transition they're going through, and I don't think all of them are going to survive, uh, clearly. But 
you know, I don't. I think if you look at the big picture, there's a lot of really interesting things happening now in terms of disseminating news, disseminating information. You know, and some of it is fake. <laughs> there's some of it has no standards. Um, but you know, one of the things I was going to say earlier, which you you reminded me of, is that you know earlier in the history of the printing, the sort of the press was very much more like what the internet was today. You know, there were very partisan journals on yep. both sides, and the sort of level of invective and insult in them was extremely high. You know, there was sort of you know maybe even at, at worse considering uh, sort of the level of discourse in general than what we would uh, accept today. You know, politicians were routinely insulted and sort of accused of all sorts of, you know, terrible things. And this was just considered to be sort of a consequence of the free press. And what changed? Was it that the, uh, the, the populace became more educated and demanded high standards? At some point, the press decided that they were going to sort of rise above this and that they were going to be impartial. but. Yeah. I think that's relatively recent. Yeah, it's it's in in the 1920s, and you have this great figure, uh, Walter Lippmann. He wrote the book called Liberty in the News, and he was saying, you see, the press, uh, it's it's drawn between two opposites. It's either the taste of the public, either um, the 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 wealth or the, the richness that can be uh, produced through advertisement. And he said, the only way of, to counteract, uh, this, to, to oppose this, 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 the only way to, to fight against this current is to have a strong institution, which is journalism. It's the ethics of the profession. And since you start developing high standards of what's journalism, then you will start to have a better press. And he was correct. He was correct. And the way he thought the press uh, was enforced for 70 years until uh, inter the internet came and changed the rules of financing and as well as gatekeeping. Because what we're changing here, what we have with your podcast, for example, is a different type of, of um, gatekeeping. Who is allowed to speak? You come here to the UPFL and you select two scholars and you talk with them. But you could do the same thing with two kids, you know, just doing skateboard on, on the, in, in, the, in the street. So uh, gatekeeping is one of the major tasks of journalism, to choose which invert, uh, information is valuable for democracy. And that's what we lost, in a sense, because we opened the gates. Okay, so everyone now... Since if you have a mic and a connection, you can uh, produce and, and publish. But the problem is that, is that do you have the skills? Do you have the skills to define what's a good information? And that's what we might lose. But isn't so? Sorry. I was going to say the the that point about gatekeeping. That some of the evidence is that there are particular types of network topology that allow complex ideas to spread. Yes. And because there are an infinite supply of lies, there are an infinite supply of simple lies, whereas there's a finite supply of truths, uh, if you need a network that allows for complex ideas to spread for the truth yeah. to win out, yeah. it, it, is that something you're optimistic might happen with this form of gatekeeping? I mean, Walter Lippmann, he wrote in the 20s and the 30s, and, and he, he wrote three huge books about media. He wrote uh, Liberty in the, Pre in the News, he wrote Public Opinion, and he wrote The Public Phantom. And he was struggling exactly with the same problems. And I'm talking about the 30s. And he was saying one of the ideas he has in Public Opinion, he says, okay, journalism should, journalists should work with academics, and especially with think tanks founded by the government for providing statistics, uh, very good uh, surveys, inquiries, uh, so I think the problem we have now with uh, the internet is the same. We have to ima imagine those kind of institutions. And I think it's, it's not an accident if the, the Swiss television is talking about coming here to the PFL and having their buildings on, on the campus. I think it's, it's a way of, I mean, perpetuating that idea that comes from Lippmann. And uh, I mean, the strong idea of Lippmann, 
he was a columnist, he was a very good journalist and a philosopher. His idea was we need institutions to deal with the technology and to, nail, to deal with the shape of uh, our society. So, yes, I'm optimistic, but we have to do that. We have to work a lot. So just to come back to this point about, so, so you still think that the, the, these are institutions, you still don't think that teaching philosophy to people to make better <laughs> decisions about what they read could be the answer? Why, why are they too distinct? Maybe they aren't. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, you know, institutions change because of, you know, popular pressure, public demand. People don't uh, sort of impose their will on if they're not even aware that there's an issue, that there's a problem, that there's, no, there's something that could be better. You know, and, and I think our class is a good example. We don't sort of propose solutions to the problems. We don't go and tell the students, you know, you should do this or you should do that. We basically sort of talk about the problems and the complexity of the problems and the historical precedents and the historical basis for the problems and let the students make up their own sort of mind as to what they think should happen uh, in the future. You know, the sort of final project in the course is a presentation on a topic of their interest. And you know, part of it is they're supposed to propose solutions to the problems. And I think that it's interesting because we don't really do that in our presentation, but we ask them to do it in theirs. And I think it brings out how hard it is to do it because their solutions in general are not very good. And they're sort of very partial. They don't really cover the, the complexity of it. But I think sort of struggling to come up with these solutions is very good because it makes you realize that this problems don't necessarily have simple solutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to your question, I think that the, you should, we have to do both. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, we've talked a lot about privacy and social networks and things like that, but in terms of AI and machines talking to people, <laughs> is that worse in the sense that we've now got black box mechanisms where we don't know, we have potentially biases that are encoded. Do we need to look at the the institutions required for the, the provenance of the training of these things? or It's a really interesting question. It's obviously a very hot topic in the whole field of machine learning these days. Um, the answer is everybody who's doing machine learning seriously and sort of applying it to any kind of problem should be concerned about the bias in the data and the bias in the training. Because otherwise the answers you get are not necessarily the correct answers. So, yeah, you know, even separated from the sort of ethical, which I think comes about a lot because of the application domain, but even if you were solving sort of a purely technical problem with machine learning, you should be very concerned about the biases. You know, there are lots of examples where sort of, you know, you train on a particular set and what you end up with is a machine learn system that works for people that are very similar to that set. You know, white people for face recognition because that's all you had in your set. People who speak English like I speak English because you didn't train with people with accents. And you end up with this tool that basically doesn't really work, right? And so again, that's another form of bias. But you know, bias is also used for the sort of much more serious consequences, sort of, you know, you know using tools for uh, judicial purposes and you basically are based that on sort of data that's yeah. collected that reflects people's biases and sort of racial prejudices is a big one in the U.S. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's a problem that you haven't built a very good system if you've sort of not accounted for this and not done your best to correct for it. And it's not easy to even know it happens and it's not easy to correct for it. And do you, would you advocate for data science being a regulated industry? Uh, no, how can you regulate? <laughs> well, just because there's, you know, because there are a lot of responsibilities that come with data science. So you've talked about bias, but what about using people's data against them? You know, what about if, you know, on on one a bit, a bit like we were discussing earlier, you know, on one level, it's great that we can pull data because we can diagnose illness faster. But what happens if we discover somebody has a pre-existing condition and we want to charge them more for their insurance? You know, like the responsibilities around data science. Well, but that's not a data science problem. Though. That's an insurance <laughs> problem you okay. just described. And I think the problem with regulating data science is that data science is just a technique that is going to be used by pretty much everybody in every single facet 
uh, of uh, industry or is already in the process of being used. You know, we have a, a master's in data science, which is a very popular master's uh, for students because it's a, an important area. But, you know, the sort of consequences of it depends on what the data is doing and what you're producing uh, from it and then what decisions you're making from it. So, you know, the one about health is a very good one. You know, and in fact, I use it in the class because, you know, you can provide two perspectives, one of which is that the insurers obviously want more accurate information about the people they're insuring because then there's sort of less uncertainty and they can price their product more fairly. But the flip side of it is that if you're one of these people with a congenital problem, then, you know, pricing it more fairly means that it would be much more expensive to you to have insurance. And, you know, the other idea of insurance is to distribute the risk among uh, sort of a larger group of people so that no one individual is sort of forced to bear the entire cost of something they can't afford. In, in keeping with the conversation we've had so far, that some sort of middle ground is the way to go, right? Because, because uh, you know, uh, premiums that apply to everybody mean that we're not pricing the risk correctly, but allowing people to use data against their interests is not. So it, it would seem like there's some sort of halfway well, house. There's, there's definitely a huge tension there, right? I mean, yeah. you know, EPFL and Switzerland in general has a lot of research going on on personalized health. Um, and that's actually one of the sections of global issues because there are a lot of issues related to that. And uh, the professor in, in SV Science de V, who, who is leading the Personalized Health Initiative, sort of is very clear that uh, he sort of believes that Switzerland needs to change the laws related to insurance before personalized health becomes widely deployed. That, you know, you just cannot. Uh, allow this information to be out there in the hands of insurance companies applied to individuals as opposed to applied to groups of individuals uh, for, for pricing. And, and a lot of the issues that we talked about about information technology can be solved through openness and meritocracy and things like that. What hap on the, uh, isn't the elephant in the room that the life sciences issues eliminate all of that possibility in the sense that people can actually buy advantage? permanent advantage is that in, is there is in what what do you think you genetic engineering yeah being able to choose that your children are going to live longer and be healthier and things like that through through yeah money well, the richest cho rich people's children have always lived yeah. longer and been healthier <laughs> yeah no, no, exactly so this does seem to exacerbate that potentially is that it, it potentially yeah. could right i mean i'm not sure the technology is really there yet to make an appreciable difference, um, except for sort of gross fake factors like sex selection, which is clearly a huge factor in certain countries. I wanted to ask you, Jim, about th this idea of, because you, you mentioned earlier, you said when the, when the internet was conceived, it was, it was an incomplete conception because it didn't have any notion of identity, for example. There was no notion of a native currency for paying for things. You, in your course, you talk about Bitcoin. In, the, in your course, you talk a lot about technologies for establishing identity on the internet. Do you think these things can be almost sort of reversed, engineered back into the internet? Are you confident that technology holds the answer to some of the problems we've been talking about? Yeah, I think they will eventually be added to the internet. The, the problem, of course, is that because the internet is everywhere uh, and is so sort of embedded in so many different systems and has so many different players building it and running it, making any kind of change is extraordinarily difficult. Um, change occurs slowly, um, much slower, and it would have been much easier to sort of fix these problems in advance. But, you know, as I said, people didn't perceive of them as real problems. And in fact, you know, the technology of it, the, you know, particularly cryptography, which is the foundation of Bitcoin, didn't really exist when the internet was invented. You know, this notion of public key cryptography was from the late 70s. Uh, before that, there was no way to do cryptography across a network. Um, it was a brilliant idea, a brilliant uh, observation, but it took many years to develop it to where we are now. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's great to sort of imagine what we could have done if we knew what we have now, but this, that's not the way things work. So just to make it more practical for a second, so, so here at the EPFL, you've got this Center for Digital Trust. Yes. 
how, what kind of technologies does that employ? What kind of stakeholders is it bringing together? How well is that working? In uh, great question. Um, so the the answer is that we have a lot of people here who do cryptography, but a lot of people who are very interested in sort of applications of blockchain, which is the technology that underlies Bitcoin. It's not necessarily related to financial information. So we're interested in how you can share information sort of more reliably and securely across the internet. So, you know, give you an example. Uh, one of the companies that participates in uh, C4DT, and I won't sort of name it, but um, they basically collaborate with a number of other companies who have information that would be very beneficial to share among this group of companies. But it belongs to, the information belongs to the company. So they don't want to sort of just put it there. They don't want to give it to the central company because they want to maintain ownership. But all of the parties would benefit. I mean, it's basically the, the tragedy of the commons again, yeah, yeah. is that if they all act individually, they sort of are worse off. If they act together, they would all be better off. And so the technology that we've been developing is basically allows the information to be shared but controlled at the same time. So, you know, you can measure, maintain strict controls over sort of who can see it, who can, what they can do with it, and you can maintain your ownership of the information, but at the same time you can share it with a group of people who are sharing, a group of companies that are sharing with you. And so this is the type of technology we're building. Um, there are a number of companies that are interested in it. Uh, you know, even uh, sort of international organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross has got a lot of information sharing problems because a lot of their operations are done in sort of very hostile parts of the world where sort of there are a lot of uh, parties that would like to know about the people that they're protecting as well. And so they need to be able to preserve information. And so the technologies like blockchain have a lot of uses beyond just building things like Bitcoin. And we've been exploring that and working with uh, companies to take the, the core technology which was developed here and then um, applying that to sort of applications that the companies come along with to demonstrate it. Another, another example is actually hospitals in Switzerland, all of which have information about their patients. And they sort of protect it and they should protect that kind of information. But you know, if I'm a medical researcher doing research on a particular disease, It'd be great if I could access the medical records of the patients all across Switzerland and many different hospitals that have that disease. I could gain a larger set of samples, you know, with informed consent. Patients could give me permission. But how do I get access to all this information? How do the hospitals at the same time maintain their responsibility to protect it and to make sure that I'm not uh, doing something with it that I shouldn't, I'm not giving it to insurance companies, I'm not selling it, I'm not, you know, um, being a Cambridge Analytica as well. And, you know, this is the type of technology that we're developing and trying to demonstrate by building applications and collaboration with other parties. And does this then, does this perform better than having a trusted third party being the, the gatekeeper of distributing that? Better in what sense, right? I mean, there's a lot of different dimensions, right? You know, Having a trusted third party is usually more efficient. You know, if you really do trust the third party, you know, just giving them all the information, they can aggregate it, they can then distribute it, they can control it. But coming up with a trusted third party is very difficult. And you know, you sort of got to wonder about what their incentives are. You know, the hospitals in Switzerland have never come up with a trusted third party for sort of sharing medical information. Yeah, and in general, I did, sorry to be possibly pessimistic, but. And normally applications of blockchain like this are better when they're p permissioned, right? Um, they're more efficient. And I'm just wondering, are we trying to tackle, because you know, the, the issue, the, the internet's a global thing. The ethics of AI is a global thing. The ethics of data science is a global phenomenon. Are these problems that we're facing happening at a time that's, you know, like, are we facing these problems at a time when the when the world is sort of fractionalizing and balkanizing? Does it does it make it harder to solve these problems? No, I mean you know the, the, <laughs> good. I, I don't think so. I mean I think you know the sort of research that goes on has become, if anything, much more international over the last ten years uh, than it used to be. It used to be you know in this field the U.S. dominated computer science research. You look in the, the conferences, the journals, it was basically US-centered publication. It's a lot more international than it ever was. Europe, China, 
um, uh, various other sort of parts of the world are participating. And there's still, fortunately, a culture of open publication. There's a lot of ideas. They move around very quickly. They're the sort of people that are innovating in this area. And then, you know, this whole sort of startup culture, uh, this uh, entrepreneurship. A lot of these ideas are now moving very fast from just being developed to actually having people to exploring them and trying to see whether there are commercial applications of them. And you know, they fail because a lot of the applications don't work or they're ahead of their time or they don't have the right market yet. This is great. With the time we have remaining, I just want to enter into um, you know, kind of a final section where we, where we indulge in some, you know, some futurism and some future applications <laughs> of, of these technologies. And um, so I read on Wikipedia, Jim, that you, you worked on the Singularity project <laughs> at Microsoft. <laughs> So let's, maybe let's start there. How, how close to singularity do you think no, no, we are? No, <laughs> you got to remember that the only thing in common with that vision of singularity is the name. Okay. <laughs> Our, the Singularity Project was a project that Gail and Hunt and I did at Microsoft. to oh, so it had nothing to do with the... No, okay. no, to rewrite an operating system in a high level to try to attack the security problems by going and sort of redoing everything from fresh. And we, you know, we, it was a great project. We did a lot of impact. There were follow-on projects inside Microsoft. We had zero impact on the, on the rest of the okay, world. Okay, so, so having exposed that I didn't do my research <laughs> properly, I'm still going to get you on that question, though. So w how far away do you think the singularity is? Uh, extraordinarily far away. Really? I do, not, I do not worry about machines replacing humans in, in, in general. You know, there, there are two forms of artificial intelligence. There is sort of a let's call general intelligence, which is sort of a machine being as smart and as capable as a human being. And you now this is what the Singularity Project, or uh, Singularity worries about, is that there is going to uh, build machines that become as smart and re even smarter than humans and decide that they don't need us. But, you know, if you look at what artificial intelligence machine learning is doing, they're doing very individual human skills. They're doing sight, they're doing vision recognition, they're doing hearing, they're doing language recognition, they're doing natural language processing. You know, but you put them all together and you know, they're not even as intelligent as a little, you know, year old baby, year and a half year old baby. And they're extraordinarily difficult to build. You know, you know, you show a baby uh, sort of a stuffed dog and then they see a real dog and they realize that they're the same thing. Believe me, no machine learned system would ever make that kind of inference. And we're talking about sort of, you know, a little infant. We're a long way from general intelligence. What about killer robots? Killer robots, yeah. But you know, these technologies <laughs> that we have, you know, you can use them to build sort of very lethal weapons. You know, whether they're robots, they will be, uh, you can call them robots, and you know it's sort of militarily attractive to do that kind of thing. And I think it's there's a lot of pressure on a lot of country in a lot of countries to sort of go down that path. And I think it's really sort of quite dangerous. And how do you stop them? Uh, how do we stop any weapon? There yeah. has to be a treaty between countries where we agree that this is sort of beyond. Uh, sort of reasonable and that the con countries all sort of step back and say we don't want this to happen we you know we agree that well, this is a, an area of weaponry we will not explore uh, you know it's happened for certain types of weapons um, not all um, unfortunately Philippe you've been quiet what, what, what worries you about um, you know the application of these technologies what's the most worrying use case that it keeps you awake at night well, one one of the things is that we we kind of lost some of our access to pluralism. We are not exposed to such a diverse uh, community with you know different kinds of opinions. Today, with the social networks, we are growing this loop, and that's one of the the main losses. The other one is that maybe we lost some of the. The institutions, and I've been using a lot this this word, and and I'd like to say that um, an institution for me is kind of a socially enforced collective habit. So, what are the collective habits we are choosing for our society? That's the only thing. 
And and you were asking before um, about philosophy. Do we have to teach philosophy or social sciences or build institutions? And I think they're they're quite different and they go together. And what we try to do in the course with uh, with Jim is we try to have a space um, for reflecting on the implications of the the technology. And and I come with my worries. Jim comes with his. And uh, also we come with, with our passions and we have this, this space to reflect on those issues. But at the same time, it's a training. It's, it's a kind of institution as well because we're training those engineers, those very gifted students uh, to think in another way uh, the, about their, their work and it, its impact on society. Jim, do you worry about runaway functions? If I've even got that terminology correct. Runaway functions. What, what do you mean? You know, this that? idea that you optimize something for something, but it just um, over time it it does it at the expense of all else. You know, so you optimize a machine to make paper clips, and then eventually sort of kills all human beings because it it wants to make as many paper no. clips. <laughs> okay. sure. As I said, I, I I don't think that that's the way we're, we're, the demise of the human species is going to come. <laughs> I think, you know, climate change is much more likely to wipe us out than killer robots. <laughs> Sad, but I think climate change is very real. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we're almost out of time. Dave, do you have another question? Any on the topic of futurism? I, just to close off on the climate change thing, do, do you think, for example, with fires in the Amazon, that, that it would be morally justified to um, put... A, let's say, infect the, uh, the cattle with BSE to, st as to stop the, the sales of beef and put out the fires? I mean, at what level c can, we, can we combat um, I think, issues? I, I think that's probably the wrong approach. <laughs> 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 you know, the, if anything, history shows that just sort of aggressive action leads to aggressive counteraction right. and that you would be better off sort of trying to uh, do what's been done, which is quite effectively, I think, is to shame right. Amazon and sort of inform the world of this problem. And, you know, that is, again, one of the sort of advantages of the Internet is that, you know, the sort of availability of technology, cheap satellites has sort of made this imaging possible. And then the Internet has made it possible to sort of disseminate the information about these fires in essentially real time throughout the world, get the celebrities to jump in and apply a lot of pressure in sort of a very short amount of time uh, to Brazil. Whether it changes it, I hope so. But, uh, you know, technology has a good sides as well as bad sides too. It can be applied to, 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 to fix problems. I think that's quite an optimistic note to finish on, but I think we can do better. So I'm gonna ask each of you to conclude with, with an optimistic uh, comment about how we can so, Take the really positive foundations of the internet and use them for so, you good. Know, one of the things I do in this course is I finish on a positive note. Good. You know, okay. we, the last lecture we do is about the whole open whatever movement, the open source movement for software, uh, you know, the open science movement, uh, you know, the sort of open data movement, sort of talking about how the fact that you sort of eliminate the cost of disseminating information has opened up all of these different sort of ways of doing software development, doing government, doing science that was just would have been just totally and completely impossible when even when my career got started. And to me, you know, this is an exciting thing is that, you know, yeah, there are bad things that happen and there are a lot of sort of people make money off it, but there are also sort of a lot of really good people out there taking advantage of the internet to sort of do things that they really get benefit out of and that the rest of us benefit out of. And if you, know, you look on Facebook or Instagram or something, there are a lot of people that are sort of really benefiting from it. I mean, there's another statistic, which I don't know if you've seen, is that you know Facebook makes two or $300 per person in the United States. But the value that people get out of it is much higher. You know, there was a very nice study where they basically paid people to stop using Facebook for a year, and they sort of had an auction. And the price for people in the United States was about $2,000 wow. to sort of not use it for a year. 
And so, you know, the, the benefit is 10 times what the sort of revenue is to Facebook. So that, you know, the difference is really what, you know, Facebook is giving you. They're giving you $1,900, uh, so, uh, $1,800 uh, worth of benefit. I think, I think that is a podcast in itself, this idea of how much consumer surplus the internet creates, which isn't captured in any of our existing measures of the economy. But I think that is, we'll, we'll get you on the podcast for that discussion. We just want to get Philippe, we want to, <laughs> want to get Philippe's optimistic conclusion so to the podcast. Sort of consumer surplus that heroin has. But. <laughs> well, I've, I've talked about Walter Lippmann and he was, he was very optimistic in the fact that democracies could thrive with uh, very good knowledge, um, very good media. So, and, and, and a link between the two. And I think uh, internet is giving us this opportunity. Uh, when I see Wikipedia, it's, it's quite fantastic, actually. And um, I, would say, I would say that um, the way internet enables collective activity and, and, and research, that's the thing that really makes me optimistic. Thank you. I'm into that. Okay, so um, I think all that remains is to thank you very much. For your time, thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, David, for taking part in this podcast.